Hi there, everyone. It's time for Chapter 13, The Earth's Changing Climate. Something to point out here, this is going to talk about the past climate a little bit and how we know things have changed over the eons from several hundred thousands of years ago, even millions of years ago, how the Earth's orbit has changed and how things continue to change and evolve on our planet. A lot of it is, everything up to this point has been natural. Mankind is affecting how the climate is evolving and continues to evolve now on our planet. And it's our actions and our behavior that is beginning to change things. And there is no doubt about that. And you will be presented that with this week in a lab module and a little bit here as well. On to the chapter. Let's talk about some of the things about reconstructing the past climate. Some of the things that we use, techniques. Uh, glacial landscapes. We know that ice has covered most of North America and Europe at times. Not just a little bit. We're talking miles thick of ice, up to 12,000 feet thick. That's a lot of ice. That's higher than any of the mountains in, in, in Colorado. Uh, that's a lot, of, a lot of water and a lot of snow, frozen and over the land. Uh, climap, a, thing is a way of mapping things out. Ice cores. And something very interesting here that I wasn't aware of. The ears inside of fish, behind their eyes, what they call otoliths, are made from a bone that is absorbed certain nutrients in the ocean that we can trace temperatures to on the planet. Very interesting concept there. And then dendrochronology, which is a more recent, up to a, perhaps a few thousand years, some of the oldest living trees on the planet. We can do some uh, look at the plant structures and uh, ages through the rings on trees and things like that. Climate throughout the ages, the Earth has been 8 to 15 degrees Celsius warmer than it is today, so it has been much warmer on our planet, and the climate was much different. But there were a lot of other things going on back then to make that more hospitable for the life that was here. That probably would not be too friendly to a place like where humans like to live, with it that much warmer. Ice age, inter interglacial periods and things like that, that's what we're in right now, we're between ice ages. Younger Dryas uh, was a period where things were cooler and mid-Holocene and the maximum where things are starting to warm up. Here's a look at what things look like across Europe at once upon a time and North America. Uh, about oh, 12,000 years ago, 10 to 12,000 years ago, we had massive ice sheets over North America. And there was a Bering Land Bridge between Alaska and Siberia. That was all land and people used to walk across that. And then there was also over northern Europe, all sorts of ice, big ice sheets down in parts of the northern parts of Spain, central Spain, even into Italy. Uh, some big uh, ice sheets and much of the Alps in the central part of the Alps, that big Alp valley between in Switzerland and between layers of mountains was a big giant ice sheet. On to the big things. The Bering Land Bridge, again, a very big one. North America here. You can see the Great Lakes and everybody even through northern Pennsylvania and down as far south as uh, parts of Illinois and Missouri, covered by ice. And a closer look at Europe, uh, where all the ice sheets covered there. Just a little bit of a, an image here. If uh, sea levels rose perhaps a meter, all this would be underwater by about three feet. Uh, that's, you know, basically wipes out all these hotels. You got about two or three feet of water in the lobbies. That's not a very fun place to be if you're building hotels. And that can conceivably happen with the predictions and climate change that we have. But basically, here's a look at the ocean temperatures about 18,000 years ago based on the land bridge over with the ice ages and things like that that was going on. Temperature, sea level, temp or sea level temperatures in Celsius again here, 25 degrees Celsius through the equatorial regions. So not a whole lot different than today. Uh, so if we take the and put the oceans in play, perhaps a little bit more warmer water through the tropics and a, a little bit warmer water pushing into the Gulf of Alaska and definitely up here into Europe. This has made Europe a much more mild climate. Uh, as this warm air pushes northward, that's carried over e Europe and makes it quite balmy compared to what we experience in the mid part of the United States. Uh, here's what we're looking at over the last 18,000 years. Uh, the Younger Dryas was a cooler period in here. And the Holocene maximum was actually just as warm as, or just about as warm, uh, or just about as warm now as we once were. Uh, so that continues to be a very evolving pattern. And here's the latest years right here. More about that coming up. Reconstructing the past climate, ocean conveyor belts and climate change. Cold, salty water sinks near the Greenland and a a actually in Antarctica. We saw that. And uh, basically what is 
causes that. When the salty water freezes, it makes a brine, and that brine is heavy, and it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Well, the water has to be replaced that's sinking, so that comes from the warmer oceans in the, in the tropics. So the water at the top flows towards the, the poles, and the water at the bottom sinks and moves towards the equators. Uh, so that's a big uh, circulation system there that normally happens. Climate during the past 100 years, we have had the Little Ice Age and then, of course, the modern warming. Here's what we're talking about over the last 1,000 years. We've actually had a normal cooling trend that we've been in. Then here's when the Industrial Revolution began uh, about oh, just a little over 200 years ago. We started pumping a little bit more CO2 into the atmosphere, and this is what has been happening. Uh, this is no lie. This is average temperatures, and we're now up to about 0.8 degrees warmer uh, than the overall average temperature for our planet. So this is a big change, and again, this is being caused by increases in carbon dioxide associated with man, and it can be proven that that's where the carbon dioxide is coming from. Reconstructing past climate temperature trend during the past 100 years, largest increase in temperature of any century during the past 1,000 years, and 6 degrees, 0.6 degrees is significant when compared to the last 1,000 years. Scientists, again, point to carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases as the cause. Greenhouse gases, what they mean is these gases act like a blanket, and they trap the heat. The heat comes in from the sun, turns into infrared radiation, and then the gases in the atmosphere reflect that back to the Earth's surface rather than allowing it to escape to space and cool. That's basically the summary there, and you will get more of that again in the module this week. Here's what we're looking at as far as temperatures again, annual average temperatures. You can see the trend since 1980 up through 2000 and beyond up now about 2010, and we continue to see that grow. Climate change by neutral events, external causes, sure there are some of those. Changes in incoming radiation from the sun. The sun has actually been getting cooler over the last 200 years, and yet we're still seeing to see the planet warm up. Change in composition of the atmosphere, change in Earth's surface, Feedback mechanisms, of course, we have water vapor. That's the number one uh, greenhouse gas. Then we have snow. That is a, a positive feedback effect. And actually, water vapor is a positive feedback as well. It helps cool the planet. And infrared radiation is, of course, a negative, which uh, helps warm the planet. So the snow is an albedo effect. That is changing as well. Here's what we're talking about, I albedo. Say we have a bunch of snow that reflects the light. And same thing here, and we get rid of the snow and we absorb more, we reflect less. And so less reflection means more heating and more warming of the layers. The more we can reflect, the better off we are at helping cool things. Climate change by natural events. Plate tectonics, mountain building, theory of plate tectonics, mountain interaction, variation of the Earth's orbits, something called the Milankovitch theory, and you can read more about that. Uh, eccentricity, Earth's orbit, precession, and when these, these things all combine, roughly every 12 to 13,000 years, we start to generate an ice age. That's a natural occurrence. And of course, plate tectonics. The plates, we used to have a conglomerate of plates together and one giant ocean. Now things are moving apart, and we're starting to separate things a little bit, and that changes the climate as well. The eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. Sometimes we are closer at certain points in our orbital pattern. And again, this is about a 13,000 year cycle for this to complete back and forth. And when we are further away and we are tilted away in the Northern Hemisphere, this is when we start to develop the ice ages in the Northern Hemisphere. Again, here's a, a little bit better showing of that. Generally, 23 and a half degrees is where the Earth is tilted and this wobbles around, makes like a cone as it moves. And in certain times of the year, we are closer and further away. July right now, we're further away from the sun. January, we are closer. That will switch in the next 11,000 years. January, we'll, we will be further away, and July will be closer. So that means winters will get more severe in the northern hemisphere in about 11,000 years. Uh, axis, approximately every 11,000 years again. Uh, here's how things change a little bit. Conditions now, where are we at? Uh, about midway, we're in January, we are at the uh, closest point to the sun, and in July, we are furthest away. That helps keep things moderate, and again, how things will change. 22-degree um, minimum tilt here. That's at the minimum, and then at the most, we're at 24.5 degrees, and we are still expanding towards the maximum, I believe, uh, though we, it could be just the opposite. We could be moving back towards um, the minimum of 22 degrees. I'm not sure on that. But again, that affects how weather patterns today. 
And today's tilted again is 23 and a half degrees. Climate change by natural events. Again, variations in solar output. Um, some other things here, sunspots. We're actually seeing an increase in sunspots. So the sun activity is increasing and it's getting a little bit warmer as well right now. But again, we're in an overall cooling trend. Topic climate models, general circulation models are not perfect, but extremely sophisticated and serve as the most reliable current predictive tool. And that's what the models are predicting. Uh, we were in a sunspot minimum. We're starting to come out of that. And solar energy, as I said, has been decreasing, though may begin to start to increase here soon. Climate change by humans, atmospheric particles. We have more aerosols that reflect the sunlight. And then uh, nuclear threat of a nuclear winter, which is minimized now due to the lack of uh, issues with uh, the Russians and things like that. Volcanic explosions, ash, dust in the stratosphere reflect light and cool the atmosphere. Uh, so there is some natural cooling that takes place when we have volcanic explosions. Here's a picture of a big volcanic explosion. And again, this will put lots of dust particles in the upper part of the atmosphere and help cool the planet. When Mount Pinatubo blew up in 1991, the following year, we had a definite drop in the Earth's average temperature. So it was a natural cooling, but it's very short term, usually about two years, and then things start moving back upwards. Climate change by humans. Recent global warming perspective. Since the beginning of the 20th century, average global temperature again has risen by 0.8 degrees. It's radiative forcing agents. The main one is carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases like methane. Disrupt radiative equilibrium, forming an increase in temperature. And overall, it rise in the Earth's temperature. And here's where we would be at if we wouldn't have had CO2 and all the other greenhouse gases put in the atmosphere. We put in the greenhouse gases, and this is what we get. The model's prediction based on that. And uh, then the actual Earth's temperature here is measured in this solid line. And then the um, precipitate or the Earth's temperature here as projected by the models. So definitely seeing an increase uh, that matches with what the models were predicting. Topic, uh, the Sahal region of the Africa. Recent studies suggest that the dry periods were due to the cooler North Atlantic Ocean and aerosols from North America may exacerbate uh, the desertification. So there has been a cooling trend in the North Atlantic and that may be due to several factors again uh, due to the lack of currents moving northward as well. Climate change by humans. Uh, radiative forcing, again, any change in average net ratio radiation that occurs at the top of the atmosphere, which is due to the, some change in climate system, is called radiative forcing. Climate models and recent temperature, it is difficult to say, you know, unequivocally that they're unequivocally that prove greenhouse forcing due to the noise in the system, but it's, we've got so many things out there that are pointing in this direction to say otherwise, we can't find anything else that would explain this and that there is no other indication out there that has credible science behind it. There are a lot of people that are throwing things out there. You can go on the internet and read all sorts of things, but it is not credible science and it is very easily disproven um, by a lot of physical parameters. Model well, sur model, um, well sulfate, aerosols, greenhouse gases, and change in solar radiation. We do model those things very well. Climate change by humans, again, future global warming projections, double carbon dioxide levels will cause a surface warming of two to four and a half degrees Celsius. That's a big change, and that's gonna make a lot of places very uncomfortable to live. Uh, and a lot of changes in how the climate, you know, precipitation, the warmer it is, the more rain you have to have. Some places will get more rain, but that'll lead to flooding. And uh, the effect of water and land masses of rising sea levels. One thing that is not mentioned here is what is happening to the oceans. The oceans are becoming more acidic as we put more carbon in the atmosphere. That means they're shellfish, like in 100 years, lobsters will have a very hard time growing their shells. Same with crabs and everything else, because the oceans will become more acidic. Another thing we're dumping into the oceans with the burning of coal is mercury. Uh, if you're of childbearing age and a woman today, you probably don't want to be eating very much seafood at all, because the amount of mercury, especially in uh, fish like salmon and other predatorial fish, is very high. Question of the clouds. Clouds reflect radiation and emit infrared radiation, positive and negative feedbacks. Of course, we this is a big mystery of what's going to happen with clouds in a warmer planet. They reflect radiation and they also emit infrared radiation back to the, so will it be a positive or negative 
effect on the feedback system and that's one that's going to take several years yet to figure out. But here's what the models are saying. If we do nothing for the CO2, this is where we've been the warming and where we hit at 2000. When they ran all the models, the different models based on different scenarios of how much CO2. If we stopped putting more CO2, if we went all to natural production of energy like wind and solar and perhaps some nuclear thrown in there as well, and we got rid of all our coal-fired power plants, cars, and used renewable resources, basically this is what would happen. If we stay on our present course, it's not looking very good. We're looking at, you know, by the year 2100, at least a three to perhaps as much as four degree warmer planet Earth in Celsius. And that's not, a, once again, that's not a very friendly place to live if we would like to be here now. Uh, again, look at some of the interesting model outputs uh, with carbon dioxide, bing, uh, methane. When that increases, bing, that's what happens to the Earth's temperature and uh, radiative forcing. And again, nitrous oxide, which is another one. And you can see all these gases combined, and this is what's been happening. It will, will continue to impact our home. This is a picture from outer space, again, uh, from the space station. And you can see towering cumulus clouds and their sh shadows across and our bright sun out there and how things look. But all this, all man's pollutants, is basically going to have a dramatic impact on how much uh, our planet is able to survive over the next 100 to 1,000 years and how well we will survive on that planet. We have no place to go, folks. This is it. This is our home. And unless we figure out something else, uh, we need to seriously take a look at what we're doing. Here's how much warming we will predict. Here's where we're at now, 2001 to 2006. Here's how much warmer the planet will be. Notice how much warmer it will be in the Arctic. 7 to 8 degrees warmer than it is now Celsius on average. That's huge. And during the summer, that means no more ice, probably from the first part of August through the end of uh, or probably about mid-October, there would be ice free in the Arctic Ocean. And uh, you say bye-bye to the polar bears with that one. They couldn't survive. They couldn't uh, change their habits long enough because they depend on that ice for food. Here's a little closer look at that and a little closer look at where we're at now. Again, we've already seen a lot of warming in the northern hemisphere and some especially in certain parts of the southern hemisphere as well in south uh, in the uh, Antarctic. Climate change by humans. Consequences of global warming. Land areas warm faster, rise in sea level. It does fertilize plants, but uh, exactly how much they can tolerate, we don't know. Land use change, desertification, plagues and climate, uh, plagues due to climate uh, changes will probably be on the increase, especially developing countries like Africa and parts of South America as well. Uh, basically, here's what it breaks down to by season right now. Uh, June, July, and August are definitely warmer over parts of North Africa and Europe, and we're starting to see some of that take place in the western part of the United States. Here's how much sea ice we've lost now. Generally, this is what has been the average sea ice extent, this line here, uh, during the summer. And, of course, during the winter as well, we're seeing a little bit less sea ice, too. And as a result, uh, the North Pole is uh, sea ice is shrinking. And this last year, we were about, like, from about here... Uh, out to here, around here, there was a big loss of sea ice. Of course, the Northeast Passage or Northwest Passage was wide open, and there were in uh, end of August, first part of September, ships traveling from New York City all the way to China across the North Pole, or close to it anyhow. Global warming efforts to curb the Kyoto Protocol was a big one. Targets emissions, credits, and creates sinks, and tries to control how much carbon is being produced. Uh, U.S. has not signed on to the protocol. And there's, it's really in jeopardy of falling apart completely as these uh, countries are very, having a very hard time letting go of uh, what the way things we're doing. California is implementing the protocol, the only state to do so so far, but uh, there's a number of other states that are trying to chime in here too to uh, supersede the U.S. government and move forward. That's all I have for you this time. Uh, have a great day.